different with you, you better do some checking up. Because I tell you what, that's what the Bible says. We have become new creatures in Christ Jesus, as it says there in 2 Corinthians. And it's good seeing all of you here today. Hope that you came expecting the blessings from the Lord. And we have a lot of things planned tonight. I'm not going to give you all the announcements that we had this morning. Uh, there was a whole lot of them. Uh, but I do encourage you to get a bulletin. I do want to give you some prayer requests. Uh, here's some things to be praying for. Uh, continue to pray for the Ben Thornton family. Uh, he passed away this morning. We've been praying for him uh, for a few weeks. And also uh, some folks that we know that uh, are sick, uh, that have COVID, and there's some other things. Uh, some of them not sure, but we do know uh, Donna and, and uh, Donnie uh, Jackson have COVID. Uh, Donna's not feeling too poorly. She's doing better. Uh, and then also I pray for the Holdrens. Uh, they've tried to stay in and stuff, and uh, both of them vaccinated, and then they have, uh, they got the virus picked up somewhere, don't know where they got it from. Uh, and then also, uh, if you would, we've been praying for Kevin Miller. Uh, he had been in the hospital there with COVID. He's doing better now, but pray for the kids. They're sick. I know there's a few other things going around. They have uh, RSV, and there's a few other things, some sicknesses happening, but I just pray that the Lord will watch over them, and uh, they won't have to continue to have some battles there uh, with the virus. Pray for Melissa to help, uh, that her health stay strong as well. Um, something else we're going to do here at the end of the service, uh, talk to Robbie Campbell. We're going to have a time where we uh, practice what it says there in James chapter 5, uh, call for the elders of the church. He asks us to uh, anoint him with oil and pray over him. And, and of course, we've mentioned this several times, and you'll hear me say it again, uh, there's nothing special in about the oil. Uh, as a matter of fact, all I use is olive oil. There's nothing special in it. But when we obey the scriptures and we honor God's word, God answers prayer. And I'm a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer of using God's word uh, to honor him. And so we're going to do that here towards the end of the service. And uh, we want to leave a little extra time for that. Uh, it's good having Preacher John and Miss Cindy here. So they have a special time at their church uh, today. And also, I didn't mention this this morning, but they have revival services coming up the 11th of October through the 15th. And uh, Brother Matt Prime, we supported him back when he was starting his church up in Petersburg, West Virginia. Uh, he's doing a tremendous job up there. And uh, But anyway, he's going to be doing revival that week. He's staying over here in our prophet's chamber, so I'm looking forward to get a chance to talk to him a little bit. And, uh, and then I found out today, uh, Timothy, his graduation... Uh, time is also that week. So we'll be actually heading down uh, to Georgia uh, to get him from his basic training graduation and uh, picking him up. But we have a lot going on that week. I uh, want to mention also on October 16th, which is that Saturday, Ballard Baptist Church is having their Ladies Fall Fellowship Luncheon. Uh, there is a sign up sheet in the vestibule for you ladies if you'd like to go to that. It's from 10 to 1 and uh, be a good time of fellowship. And then also, I mentioned this morning, and I'll announce this a little bit more as time goes on, but we are planning on having uh, a chili cook-off, a time for a men's fellowship, uh, and that will be October 30th, and we'll have a cornhole tournament, and uh, we'll, of course, eat some chili. Now, if you can't handle chili, because I know sometimes chili might be a little spicy for some folks, we are going to have some other foods some sandwiches and things. And this is mainly for uh, the men in the church, and uh, we'll, I'll give you some more details as far as you know all the other things happening as it moves a little bit closer. Um, and then probably in the next uh, next year and after that, we'll probably expand it out to other churches and invite them. But you know, fellowship's important for believers. We need to get together. Uh, we need to encourage one another in faith, pray for one another in faith, and uh, those things are very, very important. And so anyway, that's uh, going to be coming up here October 30th. Um, I want to mention also we're going to have a brief business meeting uh, after the morning service this coming Sunday. And this is for the stuff we have going on over here in the field. Uh, we need to get this <coughs> fixed. Uh, it's getting very rough. Every time we get a lot of heavy rain, it gets a little bit worse. Um, but we want to get somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, and that way uh, we can get it fixed once and for all. We don't want to create a problem over on the bridge's property, but we want to make sure it drains into the creek like it's supposed to. And uh, we have some topsoil. We're planning to reuse our topsoil that we have. 
Uh, we, have, we have several loads of clay. The fill dirt down there, we're supposed to get a few more loads of that. Um, but anyway, we got the, got the dirt very, very cheap. And uh, so we were thankful for that. And worst case scenario, if, if as a church we decide we're not going to do anything, then we'll just sell the dirt. We're not out any money. But uh, I mentioned this this morning. The Bible says, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. So if, you know, if we're going to have buildings and property and things like that to use for ministry in our church, we need to do what we need to do to take care of it. And sometimes it means we need to spend a little bit of money to do that. Uh, this is one of those areas that we would need to spend a little money. And what we're going to vote on the business meeting, I tried to think of a high dollar figure uh, because we just got back from vacation and we haven't gotten any estimates yet. But I figured as far as $10,000 for labor for somebody to come in and take care of that, I think that would be a pretty fair amount. It should be under that. If something happens and the bids we get are over that, then I'll bring it back before the church and we'll re-vote again. Uh, but I think that will take care of any amount we get. It might be more in the $7,000 range. You know, it just depends on what they think they can do with it. Um, but anyway, we'll vote on that. Uh, next Sunday morning after the morning service, just have a quick meeting there. Um, Trying to think what else. Tomorrow night, don't forget school of Bible classes are starting back up for the fall. Uh, we have uh, three classes. Uh, the first one there, questions and answers, and then difficult subjects in the light of Scripture, and then basic Bible doctrines one. And uh, had some folks let me know if you have not told me that you're planning on going to classes, please let me know so we can make sure to get a notebook for you and get everything, all the materials prepared there. Uh, and then also for nursing home service here Tuesday for Heritage Hall, uh, right now we're going to plan on that being canceled. If it changes, I'll let you know as soon as I can. But uh, the other nursing homes have canceled because they're trying to just keep their residents safe right now, which I understand that, uh, until some of these infections die down. And uh, so I think that's only using common sense there. But Anyway, we're going to plan for that to be canceled, and if it changes, then we'll just, uh, we will have a service for whoever shows up there from our church. Um, we had a love offering last week for uh, the Spencers, uh, and of course we've been praying for uh, Jesse with the uh, brain tumor and all that. Uh, had a love offering there for the family, and that was mainly last week. Now, if you weren't able to give to that and wanted to, you can still do that, but please make sure uh, if you write a check, you designate that on a check. And any checks that you write to the church for any reason, for any time, uh, don't ever write it to an individual because we'll just return the check back to you. Uh, if you write it, write it to Catholic Baptist Church, and then make sure you put it on the memo line, and then we can account for the, the money that way and where it needs to go. Um, <clears throat> now today, uh, we did this this morning, we'll do it again tonight. Uh, taking up a love offering for the Millers, uh, where he was in the hospital there for a while with COVID, dealing with that. And uh, so we want to try to help and be a blessing to them as much as we can. Matter of fact, tonight's message is we've been going through the spiritual gifts. Uh, tonight's spiritual gift is the gift of giving. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the giving and what the person who is a giver, um, some things that they deal with and struggle with, and how we all need to be uh, biblical uh, type givers because that's the way our Lord was. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else that I have here. Got a lot of chicken scratch here on my, my paper. I just want to make sure you don't miss anything. Now, we are going to have, uh, we're going to take us the offering here for tonight here in just a second. Uh, but any young people have any Bible verses or any of our adults have a Bible verse they want to say tonight, we are going to do that here after we do the next choir, or not the next choir song, the next congregational song. Uh, so we'll do that, and then I'll bring a message, and then we'll uh, have the thing there for Brother Robbie. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service, and then we'll prepare for our Sunday night offering.
name. We're going to ask the Lord's blessing here on our offering tonight. We're going to ask Chad to be my prayer for the offering, please. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for everything you've given us, Lord. So I want to thank you for the morning we had down at Freedom Baptist, Lord, the homecoming service. So I want to thank you for giving you a blessing with that, Lord. So I pray that you bless our nights, bless everyone who travels to work tomorrow, Lord. I pray that you bless us all and that we go to the upland community. Amen. Thank you. You may be
back our Master Club program on Wednesday night, this past Wednesday, for our young people. And uh, that is for sixth grade and under down to uh, three years old. And of course, the teens, they have their own class that they've been doing. Uh, you've been doing that for a while. But I wonder if any of our young people have any Bible verses they'd like to say. We got a couple. Come on up. You got some? <clears throat> Psalm 41. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Amen. Amen. Good job. Anybody else? How about any of our adults have a memory verse? Dave? <laughs> now that look from Patty, if you didn't see it, he's sitting there going, my brother counted all the she's like, <laughs> but that's good, Dave, that's good. That's our memory verse from Sunday school. Anybody else got one? Well, go ahead. Knowing this, I know our faith, our faith, James. Anybody else? Yeah. I don't remember the reference, but I will keep him in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. <coughs> trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord Jehovah does not keep his strength. Amen. Yes. Wow. Good. Anybody else? <coughs> Those are all good. It's great to get God's word in your heart. <coughs> Anybody else have one? Don't want to miss an opportunity. Am I missing? Oh, duh. <laughs> you see, if you're in, I told my students when I taught school, the best place to sit in my class is in the front rows, because I always look over their heads. So. <laughs> Miss Briggs just told me this this morning. She said, the preacher asked the little girl, did she uh, remember a, a verse? She said, yeah. Psalms 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Hang on, Miss Briggs. Yeah. He is our shepherd. Anybody else? Well, there's a great one. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And as you're turning there, if I can get uh, some individuals to help me pass out some materials, uh, we're going to, we have, we've been going through our spiritual gifts off and on, and we started this, and then I, sometimes God gives me another message He wants me to preach, and uh, we still have three spiritual gifts go through, we have, I think we have enough sheets for everybody. If we don't have enough sheets for everybody, please let me know, and uh, or if you want to share with somebody next to you, you can do that, um, <clears throat> but as they're passing that out, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12, and if you need a pen, they're passing out a pen for you, and if you don't return these pens, that's okay, these pens are just, if you want to keep them, that's fine, that's why I get them. And uh, Romans chapter 12, there's actually a couple passages of Scripture that deals with spiritual gifts. And there's a lot of false teaching on uh, gifts as mentioned in the Bible. Some churches have completely blown them out of proportion. Uh, but we want to always have a biblical view, a correct view of what God wants us to know. And in this particular passage, we find seven spiritual gifts mentioned. And these spiritual gifts are given to different individuals in the church, and uh, it is to help unify the body of Christ, but it's also to complete the body of Christ. Uh, what your spiritual gift is will not be my spiritual gift, and, and vice versa, but uh, God puts different people in place. You may have two or three of, the, of these things that you maybe uh, have great tendencies towards, and that's wonderful. But the goal, like, anybody else need a sheet? Didn't get one? Needs one? Okay, we've got some over here, Caleb. Can you help over here? We've got some over here in the front. Just help Rob and pass it down. Okay. Well, I'll run up but uh, something that we don't want to miss when it comes to spiritual gifts is Christ had all of these. Now, as a human being, as a human being, what is 
God's goal for us. What's the number one thing God wants us to do? What is it He wants us to do as human beings? Okay, even before that. You can't be Christ-like if you're not saved. you got to be saved first. He wants all men to be saved. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Did you all get one? He wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And then, once we get saved, a lot of Christians are under the, the false impression, and I'm not even sure where they got it, because I know a lot of uh, preachers who preach the scriptures don't preach this way. But once you're saved, that's not where it stops. That's where it starts. And there's a lot of things we need to do. Matter of fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we often quote those verses, but we forget verse 10 that we are saved unto good works. Uh, we are to be more like our Savior Jesus Christ in how we think, what we say, what we do, uh, how we act. And Jesus Christ had all of these gifts. He was full of all of these things. So the goal for all of us, even though you may not have one of these different types of spiritual gifts here, uh, you're saved, you'll have one of the seven for sure, but you may not have the one we're going to cover tonight. But when we get down to uh, the, the strengths of this gift, we get down to the responsibilities of this gift, these are the things we all need to work on. So Romans chapter 12, I'm not going to read the whole passage here, but you can start in verse 1 and read down uh, through verse number 6 and 7 on your own. But let's start here in verse number 6 is where we'll pick up. It says, Having been gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, and here we find this is where the seven gifts that are mentioned in this passage, this is where they start. Whether prophecy, that's the first one, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. We talked about what that was. Or ministry, this would be the servant. Uh, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And here's the one we're going to be on tonight. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And then the other two, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And then starting in verse 9 and then going down through verse 15, we find these same spiritual gifts. We find the strengths of each one of these spiritual gifts. So verse 9 are the strengths of the prophecy. Verse 10 would be the strengths of and they're in the same order, so that makes it easy. Verse 10 are the strengths of the servant or the ministry. Verse 11 would go with the teacher. Verse 12 would go with the exhorter. And in verse 13, this is the giver. This is the one we're going to focus on here tonight. It says, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. So let's pray, and then we'll get into our message. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and I pray that you will help us to uh, be obedient to the scriptures. Help us, Lord, to be more like our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, in everything we do in life. And that whatsoever our hand findeth to do, that, Lord, we might do it with our might, and we might do it all for your honor and glory. And, Lord, I pray and ask that you will bless our time together now. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have blessed this church over the years, and you have given us a good representation of these spiritual gifts. Help us to use these things to strengthen the body of Christ. Help us also to use them to further the gospel into all the world. And Father, we ask these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Now I want to say that this message, of course, as we've been going through this, this is more of a teaching message than more of a preaching message. But hopefully this is something too that you can get out of this. Now if you have not taken the spiritual gifts test that we had, I think there might still be a few in the vestibule. If there aren't any there back there and you would like to get one and take it, uh, please let me know and I'll just print those off for you. These are things are not scientific. They're not completely accurate. But these should give us a guide. This is something to give us a little help and understanding for these gifts. Now let me ask you this before we get going. How many of you that took the test, how many of you scored high on this particular gift right here, the gift, the spiritual gift of the giver? Okay, quite a few. Well, that's great. Usually there's not a lot uh, in this one here. There's not a lot of teacher. There's not a lot of the gift of giving. Uh, but that looks like a pretty good representation here. So these were the people that... Now remember, if you scored high in these categories in one of these type of gifts, you're typically going to struggle with the misuses of it. So just be aware of that. That's not uncommon. Um, but what we all need to do is develop the strengths of each gift. That's what we need to work on. 
So let's get started here. These are just kind of fill in the blank things. And I, these are just some things that I jotted down going through this. Uh, there's a scripture we can look at. But I'm going to try to move through this as quick as I can. I don't want to move to, through too quickly. But I want to go through it quickly so we have time here at the end for what we need to do. Uh, you know, praying for Robbie. This gift is illustrated by the life of Matthew. If you remember, Matthew was a publican. He was a tax collector. And God had given him this particular spiritual gift when he got saved. Strength of this gift uh, we find in Romans 12, 13. And the first one here under letter A is give to the needs of Christians. Give to the needs of Christians. Now let me say this when it comes to giving to the needs of Christians. This is best done through the local New Testament church. The reason for that is, oftentimes the pastor is aware of more information than what you are as an individual. There are people who know how to play people who tend to be givers. And they know how to give a sob story and sympathy, and these might even be people that even go to your own church. And they're not going to come right out and ask for money, but they'll give you a sob story. And because you have some of these misuses of this gift and you're a giver, you will tend to give financially to them when really you're interfering with what God's been trying to do in their life and chasing them because they've been uh, sinning in their own life or they've been abusing the finances that God has given to them already. So it's always best to give through the church if you can and then uh, use your gift that way. But we want to give to the needs of Christians. Also, uh, letter B, uh, another strength of this gift is practice hospitality. Now, this hospitality is with our time and with our possessions. So people who have the gift of giving, uh, they love to give, not just financially. It's not only talking financially, but it's their time, their possessions, anything they have. They, are, uh, they just love to give. Now, what are the misuses of this gift? <clears throat> Let's just go through some of these here quickly, and I'll try to give a little explanation of each one as we go. One misuse is they can tend to hoard resources for self. They can tend to hoard resources for their self. An effective use of the gift of giving depends upon having the fear of the Lord. A giver, we all need to have the fear of the Lord, but a giver especially needs to have the fear of the Lord uh, because they can tend to be very selfish when it comes to collecting uh, the things that God has blessed them with. One way we learn to fear of the Lord is by regular giving. Matter of fact, the purpose of this, uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14. This would be probably the only passage I have to turn to here. Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22. The purpose of the tithe was for this very reason, so that they learn uh, to have the fear of the Lord and to be a regular giver. Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22 says this. It says, Thou shalt truly tithe. Now, what is a tithe? The tithe, the word tithe means a what? Mm -hmm. Tenth. Ten percent. So if you're not good at math, the easy way to do that is if someone gives you ten dollars, and uh, even kids can do this, it's always good to teach kids to tithe. And uh, so if they get, have a birthday gift and they get $10, well, if you take that 10 point zero zero for the cents, move that decimal place one point or one place to your left. Make sure I'm going the right direction here since I'm turning around. One place to your left, that will be $1. That's a 10. That's a tie. You're not given any offering yet. You're only given a tie. Does that make sense? So this is why God gave us the tie. And it had to do with our giving. It says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth, uh, bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thy oil and of the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Now what happens in our churches today? There's not a fear of God. Why? Because people haven't learned through the tithe. You see, you have a job. Who gave you the job? 
God did. Who can take it away like that? God. You have a home. You have a car. Is it yours? Or is it God's? You see, God's given it to for you to use. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. That's what he's trying to teach us. That's part of the fear of the Lord. So we learn these things through giving. It teaches us the fear of God. So one of the misuses that a giver can have is they can tend to hoard resources for their self. If a giver stops exercising his gift, he's not only going to begin to lose the fear of the Lord, but his storing up is going to cause him to become stagnant uh, as a Christian. So he's not going to be growing like he needs to. All right, another misuse, letter B. They can tend to use gifts to control people. They can tend to use gifts to control people. A giver has a desire to make sure that his gifts are wisely invested and used. Thus, he will often buy a good quality item rather than giving the money for it. However, if items are purchased or projects are sponsored by a giver, he may be viewed as using his gifts to control lives and ministries. This happens in churches. Sometimes you get somebody with a lot of money because they know how to use resources. They have the gift of giving. And they know how to use resources wisely. God's blessed them with that. But they think that they get the misunderstanding that they're the ones that control the purse strings of the church. That's wrong. Who controls the finances of the church? God does. It's not the people. So this can be a serious misuse of a giver. So givers have to be very careful of that. Uh, letter C. Forcing higher living standards. <clears throat> they can tend to force higher living standards. Now, at first glance, that might seem like a good thing. But the problem with this is it can cause people to covet. It can cause them to covet what somebody else has. Uh, so if a giver's focus is more on the quality of the gift than the need that they're meeting, they can cause the receiver to be dissatisfied with the quality of other things which they own. A giver could also excuse personal luxuries on the basis that he is generous with his money. He says, well, I, I give my tithes, so you know, I can afford to have you know, a 15-car garage and, and 12 Lamborghinis, and I can afford to have all this stuff. And God didn't give you all that money to use for that. There's people out there lost and dying going to hell, and he's blessed you with this gift because he's wanting to, you to use your resources wisely. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor, and that's okay. But just be careful with how you use the gift that God has given you. Um, the Bible teaches us that if we are not faithful with the little things, are we going to be faithful with the big things? No. no. I've heard sometimes Christians, and I hope you don't ever play the lottery, but uh, I've heard some Christians say, man, if I win the lottery, I'm going to tithe then. No, you won't. If you aren't tithing now, when you're a job, you're making $5 an hour, and hopefully nobody's making that low anymore, but uh, you're not going to tithe off that. You're not going to tithe if you won several million dollars. It just doesn't work that way. You can't be faithful in the little things. You're not going to be faithful in much either. Uh, letter D, another misuse, is feeling guilty about personal assets. They can tend to feel guilty about their personal assets. A giver who's not in fellowship with the Lord will begin to feel guilt as he stores up funds. Even if he's preparing for a special need, he must have the reassurance from the Lord that his plans are according to God's will. Letter E, they can tend to reject all pressure appeals. Now, that's a good thing in a way, but rejecting all pressure appeals for money is not a good thing. If a giver reacts negatively to all pressure appeals for funds and they, uh, they look only for the hidden and unannounced needs, they may fail to get the mind of the Lord in a particular situation. In other words, the pastor may get up uh, and he may get, I may get up and say, hey, we've got a special need out here. We need to have this much money raised for this. And you might feel pressured, you might feel that's a pressure appeal, and because of that, resist the, the wanting to give. You have to be careful of that, because you need to get the mind of the Lord. God might have put it in my heart to say something, so he can put it in your heart to be the one to meet the need. That's the way it works. So be careful, because that can be a misuse. It's a good thing most of the time, but it can be a misuse. Um, let's see. Uh, letter F here. They can give too sparingly to their own family. They can give too sparingly to their own family. The frugality of a giver is often extended to his own wife and children. They tend to be very frugal with how they spend things, but it can, uh, their family sees them giving 
to others, meeting needs in other places, but yet here they're pen and the family they're suffering because they're pen pinching pennies all the time. And their family can tend to resent that. So you have to be careful. Uh, you want to be generous, just as generous with your own family as you are uh, with others. And here's another thing that goes along with that. It's very important for someone who has the gift of giving to listen to the counsel of their spouse. Now, if both of you have the gift of giving, that's good. But you need to listen to the counsel of your spouse. God will use that a lot of times to give you direction in your own life. And it will help you avoid uh, the damaging consequences of giving unwisely to certain investments. Okay, letter G. Giving to projects versus people. They can tend to give to projects versus people. Now remember what one of the strengths were. One of the strengths was giving to the necessity of the saints. If a giver loses his focus on meeting the needs of people, he may be unduly attracted to projects. His desire for measure and value may prompt him to build a memorial of his generosity. In other words, let's say we're going to revamp the whole activity building. We have this massive project that's going to cost us $100,000 to get done. And it's going to be extravagant. And we're going to build a huge steeple on top of the activity building that's going to be 300 feet high. And, and it's just going to be something that they can see it all the way to Peterstown. Well, a giver, if they're not careful because they can tend to focus too much on the project, can say, hey, I want to give that. And everybody's going to know that was for me. That's not a good thing. That's why it's a misuse. Uh, we need to give. The Bible talks about how we're to give. And I'll mention this in a minute. Uh, matter of fact, in the book of Matthew is the one place it tells us about giving. Let not your right hand know what your left hand doeth. Uh, and the reason is it needs to be secretly. Our giving needs to be secret because it's between you and God. It's not between. It's not to be broadcast, uh, you know, to everybody else because that can always present problems. The emphasis of scriptural giving is always to distribute to the necessity of saints and not to projects. It's okay to give to projects. But the main thing we need to do is make sure the saints are taken care of. Um, letter H, <clears throat> causing people to look to him, the giver, versus God. That can be a problem. People know you're a giver. They can tend to look to you instead of the Lord. That's never a good situation. When a giver lets others know what he is giving, he will cause many to turn their attention from the Lord to him. He also runs the danger of attracting carnal Christians with the wrong motives. And that happens a lot. These people are trained to appeal to his human inclinations and extract funds which were not directed by the Lord. You see this all the time on TV. Uh, and I'm not talking about, you know, just give a little seed money. I'm not talking about that type of stuff. I'm talking about people who seem to have legitimate ministry needs. You tend to want to give to that, but if you're not even tied into your own church, that's a problem. It's okay to give to other things and give to other needs. That's all offering. But the tithe belongs to the Lord. It comes to, to God's house, and God's house, the church house, can use it as God directs them. But uh, just be careful in that. You don't want people to look to you versus God. Uh, this even happened to a youth pastor. He wanted his, uh, the people in his youth ministry, wanted the youth to love him. And God rebuked him for that years later. And you know that youth pastor, as much as those young people love him, there's hardly a one of them in church now. And this has been 30 years. It's been a long time. Not one of them. I mean, there is a couple of them that are, but most of them, I'm talking, there's a huge youth group. Most of them aren't in church. You know why? Because the goal is always to turn people to Jesus. It's not to turn people. If my goal as a pastor is not to get you to like me, not to get you to like my sermons. My goal is to get you to see Jesus. If I can get you to see Jesus, everything else will take care of itself. And that's what a giver needs to do is not turn people's attention to himself, but always turn it to God. Uh, letter I, they can another misuse is they can tend to wait too long to give. They can tend to wait too long to give. Because they're wanting to give to the perfect thing, they can tend to wait too long. If a giver is not instantly obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and this is why they need to have the fear of the Lord in their life. He may lose the joy of seeing God accomplish miraculous provision through him. Okay, what are some right characteristics? Now, the misuses are things that people who have the gift of giving, those are things that they're, they have to work on. They may not have all the misuses, but they'll probably have some of them. 
But one of the right characteristics that we all need to have when it comes to uh, this particular gift. Letter A, we need to be able to see resources others do not. This is learning. You need to teach your kids this, to learn to be alert to see things that need done. Uh, you know, and I know those of you who have kids, and I'm like this too, so I'm preaching to myself. I come in this situation, there's a lot of things I don't notice. As a matter of fact, Becky asked me today, she goes, you see my pillows I have on the porch? Or maybe it was yesterday. And was it yesterday or today? Today. She goes, you see my pillows I have on the porch? It's like, no. <laughs> That's what I think. Is this a trick question? You know? uh, she's like, well, I didn't think so. And so I went and looked. At, I was like, oh, those are nice. But see, I didn't look. I didn't see something that would be very obvious to other people. Now, something that we all need to learn to do. There are some people, a servant is very good at this, at seeing needs other people have. Givers are very good at this, and seeing uh, resources that other people might need. But we all need to learn to look for those things that are not so obvious all the time. And try to be aware of it. We'll get kids in here sometimes that might have a need. Uh, maybe they're hungry. We need to be sensitive to that stuff. Not just assume because our belly's full, everybody else's belly's full too. Uh, they come in on a bus or something on the van. Uh, they might need some food. We need to be aware of stuff like that. So that's something we all can work on. Um, letter B. Invest themselves with their gift. We all need to invest ourselves with our gift. The giver needs continuous reassurance that his decisions are in God's will, whether he has little uh, or much to give. To achieve this, he will first give himself and then his gift to the Lord. And isn't that what the Bible says we ought to do? Matter of fact, Paul explained how the Macedonians, and here's what he said, they first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. That's what we all need to work on, giving ourselves to God first, and then once he has you, he'll have everything else you have. Uh, letter C, uh, desire to give high-quality gifts. We mentioned this about sending stuff up for the mission. We don't want to give people our junk. We want to give high-quality gifts. The giver's ability to discern value motivates him to provide quality gifts. He wants the gifts to last. Matthew recorded in greater detail than any other gospel writer the gifts given to Christ. Probably never noticed that before, did you? The gifts that were given to Christ at his birth, he recorded more detail about that than anybody else. Uh, he's the only writer who mentioned the treasures that were brought by the Magi. He described Mary's ointment as very precious. He described Joseph's tomb as being new. Why? Because these were high quality gifts and he represents this gift of the giver. Letter D. They hope their gift answers the prayer. A giver who is in fellowship with the Lord will be prompted to give even when the need is not so obvious. But his ultimate confirmation that the gift was according to God's will is when he learns that it was in fulfillment to an answered prayer. Letter E, desire to give secretly. I mentioned the verse, let not your right hand know what your left hand doeth. Just as the giver looks to the Lord for direction, so he wants recipients to look to the Lord for provision. And that's the goal, is get them to look to the Lord for provision. The giver knows that the future reward is more valuable than present praise. So he will give quietly and often anonymously. Matthew is the only gospel writer who emphasized secret giving in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. We don't have time to look at that right now, but uh, he's the only one that mentioned that. Letter F, concern that giving will corrupt. Concern that giving will corrupt. A mature giver understands the destructiveness of the love of money. He is very aware that the disciplines that God taught him in acquiring assets may not have been learned by those who need his assistance. Therefore, he looks for ways of giving which avoid dependency, avoid slothfulness, or even extravagance. And that's where a giver can be more discerning with their giving than maybe other people, but we all need to learn to be that way. Uh, letter G, exercise personal thriftiness. Exercise personal thriftiness. The personal assets which the giver has are often the result of consistent personal frugality while being content with basics. They don't go out and waste their money. They're not living. The Bible says, he that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. You love pleasure, you're not going to be rich. It's not going to happen. So that somebody who has the gift of giving, and we all need to learn to do this, is be content with such things as we have, and God tends to give you more. 
Uh, and he does that so we can continue to give to others and meet the needs of others. Um, a giver will always be concerned in getting the best buy, not with how much he has left. He will spend extra effort in saving money and being resourceful with what he has. Letter H, use gifts to multiply giving. Now, we see this at the radio station. We see this a lot. The motivation of the giver is to encourage others to give. He wants them to ex or experience the joy and spiritual growth that comes by sacrificial giving. Thus, the giver may provide something like matching funds. <coughs> you know, everybody gives, and then the giver will give matching funds or something. We see that at the radio station all the time. Uh, they may provide the last payment of something in order to encourage others to give to that. So it encourages giving by other people. And then lastly here, letter I, confirm the amount of their giving with counsel. They confirm the amount of their giving with counsel. This is something we all ought to do, especially if you're married. Uh, you ought to talk to your spouse. A giver reacts negatively to pressure appeals. They look instead for financial needs, which others tend to overlook. And a husband who has the gift of giving will often confirm the amount that he should give by seeing if his wife has the same amount in mind. Matter of fact, when we talk about faith promise giving here at the church, uh, you know, I talk to Becky and say, you know, what is it you think God you know, wants us to give this year? Uh, here's what we've given before. What do you think? And uh, I want to confirm, are we both on the same page with this? That's, that's what we need to do. We need to seek counsel when it comes to our giving. And all of these things is to help us be more complete in Jesus Christ. And you will not be like Jesus if you're not a giver. Simple as that. We all need to develop this thing about giving. Giving ourselves first to the Lord. And then, once He has us, He'll have everything else that belongs to us. Or that we think belongs to us. That actually belongs to Him. So, we're going to have a word of prayer. And uh, we're going to do, we're going to close our service here a little differently. We're going to have a song of invitation. Uh, if you want to come up, pray for these names on these cards, these lost individuals. I want to encourage you to do that. If you have a need you'd like to pray for, I want to encourage you to do that. I'm going to get a chair up here uh, for Robbie, and then uh, as we pray, I'm going to pray first, then we'll play the piano, and then I want you to turn to James chapter 5, and I'm going to share with you just something here from the scriptures and explain what it is that we're actually doing, uh, in case you've never seen something like this done before. But let's pray, and then we'll have a song of invitation. You can come up and, and uh, pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us instruction. And you've shown us ways in the Bible how we can be more like our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will help our giving to be something that always honors you. Help us to always give secretly. And so that, Lord, that we receive a great reward in heaven and not be rewarded here on earth for it. But Lord, I pray that you will use our giving to always reach others with the gospel, to help uh, the Christians that need our help financially as we take up love offerings and do other things. Uh, help us to always be there for one another. Lord, I'm thankful that you have blessed us with a giving church. And I pray that we'll continue to be a giving church. And that we can just be a channel of blessing used for your honor and glory. Father, we ask these things now and pray that you will be with this invitation song. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 318. 318, if you would, let's stand. If you want to come pray, the altar's open. 318.
Take your Bibles, turn to James 5. I preached a series of messages on uh, a Wednesday night on this passage here in James 5. And, and I'm going to ask Robbie if he would come on down and sit up here in the chair. You can go ahead and cut off for service there. <laughs> 